Your project for assignment is a bicycle seat, also known as a saddle. This project will be used in a future final project, which is an entire bicycle assembly. For this project, you have been provided with a starter file, which includes four layout sketches. Two sketches represent rough layouts of the seat, and two sketches represent rough layouts of the mounting rails on the bottom of the seat. Rather than starting completely from scratch, you should start your design by using this set of layout sketches in the starter file. This is to guarantee that you design your seat that is close to industry standard dimensions will guarantee that you won't inadvertently end up with a seat that's three feet long or only three inches long. Typical triangular bicycle seat is about 270 to 280 millimeters long. Seats that have a pointy tail will be longer than this. However, the widest part of a seat, which is where the pelvic sit bones rest, is always about 215 millimeters from the nose of the seat regardless of the tail shape. The widest point of the seat will also tend to be the highest point of the seat and then will taper downward toward the nose. Usually the nose is anywhere from 5 to 10 millimeters below this high point. Some seats will also be additionally scooped out in this area to provide additional comfort. The seat attaches to the seat post via a clamp clamps on to the rails mounted to the bottom of the seat. All clamps are designed to clamp onto rails that are 7 millimeters in diameter and are spaced 43 millimeters apart. When you are designing your seat, you cannot change this aspect of your design. When the seat is mounted to the post, the rails will normally be in an upward sloping position. This slope is included in your layout sketches in the starter file. You should not change this slope, but if you wish, you can take this entire rail section and shift it upward or downward as needed. Thin racing seats like this one will usually have rails which are visible from the side, but thicker, cushier seats will often have the bottom edge hanging down much lower and hiding the rails when viewed from the side. Now let's look again at the starter file. Two sets of layout sketches have been provided. First set provides blocky rough outlines for the seat when viewed from the front and the seat when viewed from the top. This drawing shows the top view and the front view layout sketches together. The top view represents just one half of a typical triangular seat. The wide point is about 215 millimeters from the nose. This is a racing seat outline. Typical width is about 140 millimeters. If you're going to be designing a more cushy seat, probably your seat will be wider. The seat is also shown as 275 millimeters long. This is typical for triangular seat. If you're going to have one with a pointy tail, then your tail will probably be somewhere out about here. The wide point of the seat will always be here, which corresponds to the high point of the seat when viewed from the front layout. These dimensions represent typical thicknesses of a racing bike seat. Again, a cushier seat will be thicker and deeper. The next two layout sketches represent the mounting rail, seen from the front view and seen from the top view. This image shows both the top view layout of the rail and the front view layout of the rail, all in a single picture superimposed over the blocky layouts of the seat itself. You only see one rail in the top view, but the dimensions reflect the spacing between one rail and what would be its mirror image over on this side. The key dimension is the distance between the two rails, which is 43 millimeters. This absolutely must not change in your design. In the front view layout, we have a representation 
of the mounting blocks that anchor the rail into the nose of the seat and the tail of the seat. And here we have the path of the rail. This is that upward sloping area that I talked about earlier. You should not be changing this angle. In addition to this, we have a starting point for where that angle begins and an ending point. So this dimension and this dimension should not change either. If you need to change them by one or two millimeters, that's okay, but no more than that. You can, however, take this entire section and shift it upward or downward depending on the needs of your seat. You see that's controlled by one of these dimensions here and a dimension here. Furthermore, these mounting blocks can be shifted forward or backward as needed and made longer or shorter as needed. Now let's finally take a look at the build procedure. I'm going to roll the feature tree all the way up just below the first two layout sketches. On the front plane, I've drawn a new seat layout sketch. Here you can see I've drawn a new layout for the front view of my seat using the rough layout as a guide. The nose of my seat aligns with the origin, but the tail is actually longer than my rough layout because I'm going to have a pointy tailed seat. The high point of my seat corresponds to the high point in the rough layout. The low point of my seat actually does not correspond with the high point, which is also where the wide point is of the seat. So it's not necessary that this point and this line are in alignment with each other. Note that I've put some key dimensions at the ends of my splines. Rolling down further, on my top view, drawing a sketch of the seat, again using the rough layout as a general guide for the shape of my seat. Here again, the tail of the seat is longer than the rough guide. The wide point of my seat correlates with the high point of my seat. They don't have to match perfectly, but they should be within one or two millimeters of each other. Again, note that my wide point and my low point, in this case, are not in the same place. On some seats, they will be. But typically, the low point of the seat, when viewed from the front, will be forward of the wide point of the seat. Notice that I've made relations between the end of the seat in the top view and the end of the seat in the front view, and the nose in the top view and the nose in the front view. Continuing to roll down the feature tree, I finally get to my rail layout sketches, which were supplied to me in the startup file. I purposely made these new layouts that I drew come before the rail layouts so that I could then go back and adjust my rail layout sketches to conform to whatever shape of the seat that I finally came up with. Make sure that whatever changes you might make in one rail layout sketch are reflected in the other rail layout sketch. In most cases this will happen automatically because there are already relations in these sketches between corresponding points. I've turned my layout sketches back on but left the rough layouts hidden. Rolling forward, I have a sketch which will be used for locating the planes that will be used for profiles for making a boundary of the seat. Several of these planes are in strategic locations such as the high point of the seat or the low point of the seat or close to the tail where the boundary changes very rapidly any places where there might be a large span in between planes. This sketch then will control all the profile planes for the boundary. Continuing to roll forward, we finally get to our first actual feature, which is a boundary of the seat. 
The boundary consists of a series of profiles drawn on the profile planes, a top guide copied from the front layout sketch, a bottom guide copied from the front layout sketch, and a projected curve made from curves copied from the top and the front layout sketches. The seat boundary is then mirrored. And if we turn on our zebra stripes, we can see we have a good match but not a great match between the two halves and we see that the blend is not perfect. Now before I go any further, let me just say that we learned several methods for making mirrored boundary that is smoothly blended together. One method involves making one half, mirroring it to this side, slicing the center out, and then building a new boundary which bridges between the two halves. The other method is to build your entire boundary, both left and right sides, all at one time so that each of your profile sketches includes the full shape of the boundary. Either method you want to use is fine. Remember if you use the second method where you build both halves at the same time, you might have to shave a thin amount of the bottom material away to eliminate any degenerate points that will be at the nose and the tail of the seat. This demo obviously uses the method of slicing the middle out and building a new boundary. When you use this method, make sure that the center boundary also includes a profile copied from the front layout located on the front plane. If for some reason your slice has to be extra wide, add a guide curve at the tail and the nose to help maintain the original contour of these areas when the bridging boundary is built. Turning on our zebra stripes we see that everything is blended together nicely. The next step is to shell with a thickness of 3 millimeters. You might find that the shell command will give you some funny surfaces on the inside depending on what your outside surface is. Don't worry about that. The next step is to add a bottom edge fillet to the edge of the seat to finish off the seat portion of this project. Once again, if you can't get the shell or the fillet to work properly for you, try the trick of skimming just a bit of material off the bottom before making the shell. Should be no more than about 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters. Finally, it's time for us to make our mounting rails on the bottom of the seat. We start with a projected curve. which is made by first copying the top view and front view sketches of the mounting rail layouts. While we're at it, we'll add a new plane which we'll use for drawing the 7 millimeter diameter profile of the rail. This plane will be at the tip of our projected curve. Make a new 3D sketch and copy the projected rail curve into this sketch using convert entities just like we did for the handlebar tutorial. Then wherever the corner points are of the curve, add a fillet so that we have one smooth continuous path. About 20 millimeters will be right. On the profile plane you just created, draw a 7 millimeter diameter circle, give it a pierce relation, to the 3D rail curve, path curve that was created a moment ago. Use the profile and the path and sweep them, which gives us one rail floating in the bottom of the seat area. The rail and seat are not directly connected together, so if you look at the top of the tree, you'll notice that a new folder has been created. This is solid bodies, two. One solid body is the seat, the other solid body is the rail. Later these bodies will be connected together when we make the mounting blocks at either end of the rail. 
Rolling forward again, we will just take this rail and mirror it about the front plane. Make sure you use the mirror bodies option, not the mirror feature option. Now we should have three bodies, which are two rails floating in space underneath the seat. We're coming into the home stretch now. The second to the last features we need to add are the mounting blocks that will anchor the tips of the guide rails into the seat. Starting with the rear block, this is made by copying the profile of the block from the rail layout sketch. This profile then is extruded using an up to surface option in this direction and an up to surface option in this direction. You notice that I've made sure that the top of the block is a little bit lower than this edge in the side surface so that the up to surface command will not fail. If the top of the block is too high, it will be above the top of this surface and the command will fail because this upper portion of the block won't have any surface to go to. Similarly, if the lower edge of the block has to hang down below the lower edge of the seat, this command will fail as well because once again, this portion of the block won't have a surface for SOLIDWORKS to go and extrude up to. Some designs require that the block does come down below the edge of the seat. In that case, what you have to do is just make sure that your block does not come down lower than the edge. Extrude it up to these surfaces. And then make a second extrusion off of this face, which will then bring the block down low enough to encompass the tips of the rails. So this would be a case if for some reason the tips of your rails are hanging down below the bottom edge of your seat. If you want, the block can also come much further back than what I'm showing here. It can come almost all the way to the tail of the seat. But don't bring it all the way to the back because you'll run into the same problem where you don't want to go farther back than the farthest back point of either of these surfaces. We complete this by doing the same operation at the front. And we put a little finishing touch to these blocks by adding some fillets to the edges. If your blocks hang down below the seat, you're definitely going to want to add some fillets so you don't have sharp edges hanging out in space. The last operation is to add a small graphic or decoration to the seat. I'm going to add it to the nose area. And to do this, we want to add a plane that is well outboard of the seat. The dimension doesn't really matter just as long as it's farther out than the area that you plan on adding the graphic. In this case, I'm just going to add in my sketch some text and use this as an extruded cut. And instead of using the up to surface command, we're going to use a new one called offset from surface. And the face I'm selecting is this face of the seat. What this allows me to do is do a cut that goes up to the surface and then continues going past it by whatever amount I specify. To start doing this command, set a large offset amount, say one millimeter, so that you can see whether or not the cut is offsetting into the surface or not quite making it all the way to the surface, as we see here. Once you've established that you have the offset going in the correct direction, turns out we want to use reverse offset in this case, then you can reset this dimension to a much smaller amount, 
what we want to do is just barely cut into the surface so we'll have a, an edge that will show up for our graphic. So I'm going to make this 0 0.01 millimeters. That's less than a thousandth of an inch. And then to add some contrast, I can go to this feature and change this color by going to the appearances, clicking on the feature itself, which opens up a box I can use to change the color of the feature. So let's change this to a new color. Now we'll create some contrast between the graphic area and their surrounding seat. And this is only cutting into the seat by the barest amount. Now you're almost done. We can see that there are quite a few features in this feature tree. First thing you want to do is make sure that all your features are named. If you really want to do yourself a favor, name the features while you are creating them rather than waiting till the very end. This lets you more easily diagnose problems or modify your design as you're going. The next thing you want to do, and this is part of the project requirements, is to create some folders to put these features into. This really helps take a very long complicated feature tree and brings it down to something manageable. Here we see the rough guideline sketches have been put into one folder. Our new layout sketches plus the rail layouts in another. All the planes have been located in their own folder. All the seat related features in a folder. The rail related features in a folder and then finally the decoration features. Folders do not affect your design. They do not affect any of the parametrics or how the model will rebuild. And you can always delete a folder. I'll delete this one just by clicking on the folder, deleting. Click on this one to delete. I'll demonstrate how to add features into a folder. So I'll click on the first feature I want to add to a folder right click on it and simply say add to new folder and it gives me an opportunity to name it so I'll just call this rail features here's the feature that I first put into the folder then I can take other features and just drag them into the folder like so. One final note, some people have seats that have a cut in the back or a slot. When you're doing this, add this feature as a separate feature after you've made your main boundary. When you do this then, that means your layout sketches should pretend that the slot is not there and your boundary will go to some imaginary point out here which is going to be farther out than what the final length of your seat will be once this cut is made. So this imaginary point that you're going to boundary to is going to appear both in your front and your top layouts. Then after you've completed the boundary in your top view, create a sketch that cuts away using an extrusion this area. Then you can put in some sort of a fillet along this edge. I'll go over this in more detail in class, as this video is already getting long enough. That's it. Good luck.